why write a book on the Catholic Church? It is a crime to assume, as Glenda, where's Glenda, would tell us, uh, na, yeah. it is a crime to assume, but I am breaking this rule today. I am sure that question is swirling in your mind. Indeed, why write about this venerable institution that has been the bedrock of faith of majority of Filipinos, a divine institution that governs us, that governs how we live, how we conduct ourselves as human beings, how we relate with each other, and even how we procre procreate. It is like committing a sacrilege. The church rivals the judiciary as a secretive institution, operating a distinct and separate world apart from us mere mortals with its own laws, codices, and regulations. It is a world where the code of merta is highly observed and valued, where secrecy is the norm rather than the rule. Only a few chosen mortals are allowed to have a peek in this secretive world, and even they are bound to secrecy under pain of excommunication. When I wrote about this particular bishop who sired a child with a woman, an official from the papal nunciator told, told me, the church has its divine strength as well as its human weaknesses. It is the human weaknesses of the men of the cloth that the book sought to tackle. But then, why about them when they are not elective officials that hold public purses, when they are not politicians whose decisions and actions affect us all? Years ago, I proposed a story just like what Gigi told or earlier said. I proposed a story about looking into the financial accountability of church officials. My friend, that was uh, Rick Puod, and I pitch our story to an organization that has distinguished, distinguished itself as the best benchmark of Philippine journalism. No one actually knows where the donations go to the church go, how they are spent, how they are accounted for. The head then of the media group asked Rick and I this question. Why question the donations when it is freely given to the faithful? Are you trying to question their faith? In other words, our proposal was being rejected. Um, I countered that precisely, the faithful are giving their donations to the church out of faith and out of trust. How do we make sure that they do not abuse or violate that trust? How do we make sure they honor the trust and make them accountable? Um, I never got any reply from from the head of that major organization. As moral guardians and keepers of our soul, church leaders are held accountable to a higher standard, especially on issues of betrayal of trust. Not only are they accountable to the people, but all also to, the, to a higher source from where they draw their moral responsibility. As pastors, with the capacity to influence others and with legitimated power. There already exists an imbalance in the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, or what one describes as inequality of power. Former priest Aloysius Cartagenas, who I quoted in the book, writing about this paradigm, says, says that, that, that the power differential is a byproduct of the hierarchical nature of the church and it is justified and sustained in mutually reinforcing ways. By virtue of this institutional mandate to assume church leadership, the cleric is vested with a power that the lay person does not and cannot have. This power is increased both by the corresponding expectations people have of him and by the fact of his special competence through which he can do certain acts which others cannot. When clerical authority or power is misused, abused, or even withheld, for instance, in cases of sexual abuses by priests and church officials, it is no different from taking advantage of the vulnerability of the faithful. In the book, you will read specific examples of how such power imbalance were exercised by church leaders, how it was used to perpetuate, perpetuate 
tweet the cloak of secrecy and the culture of silence to hide wrongdoings of its members. It shows a, a church of divine origin and inspiration, but with its human frailties. Are we out to destroy the church? Of course, the answer is no. How can one book destroy a church that has been in existence for, for more than 2,000 years? As, as my favorite Archbishop Oscar Cruz said, the church has been there for two millennia. There must be something divine in it to survive that long. Which is true, actually. <laughs> Instead, we try to portray a church that is divine and human as well, a local church trying its best to institute reforms, taking baby steps to respond to the changing times without compromising its principles and dogma. You will read stories about churchmen attem attempting to navigate the mission and vision of the church in the context of changing times, but staying true to its divine mandate. We take consolation to the fact that there are church leaders imposing the standards it has set to the faithful to its members as a sign of accountability. We take comfort that there are church leaders who have remained true to their calling, avoiding the trappings of power, cloud influence, working silently behind the scenes for a better society. We take, you, we take our cue from Cardinal Tagli's call for humility, for its members to go down from Mount Olympus and recognize the failings and frailties of its members. We appreciate his recognition of media's role in, in engaging the church. In his speech at the International Eucharist, Eucharistic Congress in Dublin in, on June 12, 2012, Tagli said, and I quote him, we live in a world dependent on and driven by social communication. In itself, the world of media and internet, in, in, and internet constitutes a new culture. For the church, mass media need to be evangelized as they could very well serve as means for the spread of the gospel and its values. However, media practitioners observe that when they report on abuses committed by the politicians, financiers, etc., the church appreciates them. But when they expose anomalies within the church, they are branded as anti-church and anti-Catholic, even if their information comes from people close to the church. The crisis invites us to reassess our relationship with the media as we challenge them to be faithful and fair in whatever they are reporting. The church should also be prepared to be scrutinized by the media, provided the norms of fairness and truthfulness are applied to all, especially to the victims. That's the word of Cardinal Tagli.